Science Cafe. And I'd like to start the introductions with just a little bit of a preamble because this is actually a, a new effort on our part. Uh, I've been director of MDIBL now for four years. And uh, before I came to MDIBL, I was at uh, Harvard Medical School and Vanderbilt Medical School, so what I call big academia. And one of the reasons for me to give up all the trappings of those kinds of places, all the security of those kinds of places, is because MDIBL was a small institution that was getting ready to undergo a, a revolutionary transformation. And one of the things that was very attractive and important to me is, is what was also going on in society. And that's the fact that uh, the days of scientists sitting on mountaintops and professing are over. Uh, we've got to be studying important problems, not just ones that interest us. And important problems are things that are defined by the needs of society. So one of the key things of MDIBL's mission and vision going forward is that we're going to be taking our knowledge, our expertise, and our discoveries, and wherever possible, we're going to be translating those into solutions to important human health and environmental health problems. And that's something you're going to be seeing more and more as we go forward. So I've done a number of things to try to dramatically accelerate that process at the lab. And one of the things I've started is a greatly increased number of conversations about what I call the business of science. And really today you're going to hear, I guess, our first formal presentation about that. There'll be many more going forward. But uh, Bob and uh, his colleague David, the co-conspirators, are going to talk about uh, the idea of moving things from a scientist's bench into a new technology. And just a quick introduction about uh, the two speakers. Bob Morris is uh, one of our uh, visiting scientists, visiting faculty members, plays a key role at the lab. Bob did his uh, undergraduate at Lafayette College in Pennsylvania. Uh, from there, he went on to Harvard uh, University to do a PhD. And after postdoctoral work at UC Davis, he went off to uh, Wheaton College, where he's risen through the ranks and is now a professor and chair of the biology department. David Hazenga, his colleague, uh, did his uh, undergraduate at UC San Diego, went off to uh, graduate school at Harvard. I think that's where the two of them met, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and from there, actually took a detour after he finished uh, his PhD. And I'll call it a detour because it came right back to science, ultimately. He went off to law, to law school and got uh, at Emory University and got a, a JD in 2000. And ever since that time, he's been heavily involved in really all aspects of technology, biotechnology uh, uh, development, uh, patent uh, development and prosecution, and uh, really venture capital funding of, of ideas that are made, discoveries in the laboratory, moving them into uh, uh, new consumer products, new drugs, new devices, etc. cetera. Uh, most recently, he's been at Upstream uh, Partners, and he's also the founder and director of uh, Tau Life Sciences. And these are groups that are involved in IP advisory, and also, really, uh, Tau Life Science is involved in all aspects of intellectual property development in the uh, biomedical world. So it's great to have them both here today, and they're going to give us a unique view about science and how you move it from the bench into the structure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there are two of us speaking tonight. We, will, we would love to turn this into a discussion. So please, if you have questions, ask us at any time. And we're going to start with a discussion about several different drugs and how those drugs are related to each other. So we're going to tag team this um, and talk about the interrelatedness between applied health science and basic science. And there are two, those are two topics. We're two scientists, but please don't get the impression that I'm just the basic scientist, David is the applied scientist, because our, one of our messages tonight is that that's kind of a, a false dichotomy, a false separation, and that those two fall, in a, fall together uh, in a spectrum. So there's the controller. Am I starting? You're starting. Yeah. All right. So we're going to start off with a little discussion about a few drugs. And what we're going to do is to see, just by a show of hands, if anybody has heard of these drugs. Nupagen. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Nupagen uh, is a drug that helps people who have low white blood cell counts. So for example, if you get chemotherapy and it is hurting uh, your blood cells, People will take Nupagen to try to boost that. How about Rotatech? 
Rototech is a very high-tech uh, vaccine that is uh, designed to deal with the rotavirus. The rotavirus causes everything from death in extreme cases, but it's mostly severe discomfort, and it's often uh, a third world disorder. How about Remicade? All right, we got a few hands on that one. Anybody want to say what Remicade does or what they think it does? Methotrexate. What's that? It's methotrexate, isn't it? Yeah, well, yes. So it is a drug that is designed to deal with uh, uh, sort of um, uh, immune disorders, right, or, or inflammation disorders. How about flu mist? Anybody take flu mist? I got one. My wife. That's okay. <laughs> Raise your hand. Raise it high. There we go. That was a plant. That was a plant. plant. Flu mist. <laughs> well, the name sort of gives it away, right? But flu mist is a form of, de of, of delivering a live attenuated flu virus for the flu vaccine that people take. Lastly, Imtriva. Anybody heard of this? This is what's called a, 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 a retroviral, an antiretroviral. It's usually an HIV drug. It's given to people who have severe viral infections, and it prevents the replication of those, of those viruses. So now comes the test. I did tell you that we were going to have a test, right? So what do these drugs have in common? Bad things. There you go. That's a great answer. That's exactly right. People make drugs for bad things. Good. They fight viruses. That's a good one. That's a very good one. The piece of these that we are interested in for tonight are these two characteristics. Number one, all of those drugs started out at academic institutions. They all started with researchers like Bob, right, like Kevin, who were working with grants and with uh, uh, monies often from the federal government. So all of you in this room helped bring those drugs to market because they started with federally funded dollars at academic research institutes. As opposed to the pharmaceutical industry. As opposed, yes. They started with scientists rather than Yes, that's exactly right. They started at the academic institutions, but they eventually all moved to those large pharmas. That's right. The second thing that we're interested in trying to get across tonight is that all of these drugs started with basic science questions, or what we think of as basic science questions. People weren't going, I want to, I want to make this drug to treat rotavirus, right? It started with research that, were at, that was asking much broader questions that eventually allowed people to achieve the production of these drugs. So, if you can remember these two ideas for the, by the end of the talk, then Bob and I have done part of our job. Because most people would not expect this. Right? Most of society would believe uh, that, that, as you said, large pharma was responsible for this. All right, now we're so heading off. The, this split, I made the point early, but this split between basic research and applied research, we're going to suggest, is artificial. But traditionally, basic research is the study directed toward gaining scientific knowledge primarily for its own sake. Okay? That's the dogma, that it's this curiosity-driven and a completely curiosity-driven enterprise, and that applied research is study directed toward gaining scientific knowledge to meet a recognized need, and that that um, and that those two camps are entirely separate. Well, we're we're going to suggest that that that's false, but for a few different reasons. One, the applied scientists think that basic research paths do not always progress in a predictable direction, and that's not good. That's it's it's unpredictable. It's not therefore not quite as productive as it could be. But Dr. George Smoot at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory said, people cannot foresee the future well enough to predict what's going to develop from basic research. If we only did applied research, we would still be making better spears. <laughs> and that's an excellent example of how applied research starts with an idea and works on improving that idea. 
our, one of our points is that by combining basic and applied research and realizing they're on a spectrum, both advance faster. In reality, basic research and applied research are flavors of the same process, and they're really the same thing. Identify an idea, test that idea, advance knowledge through discovery. Basic research and applied research are interrelated and therefore and, and interdependent. And the wheel that I, the way I like to think about it, actually is going to create a, a cycle and that might, does include some apples and oranges. Okay, but I see. My basic, the, the basic research provides discoveries that fuel applied research. And those discoveries spur, uh, uh, are provided to applied researchers. Applied researcher, uh, or applied research then, spurs funding for basic research. It's discoveries and the products that come from applied research that generates economic growth. And that economic growth is so valuable that governments are in the business of funding basic research because they see the value in providing a foundation of knowledge for applied research. And the National Institutes of Health is a good example of that. We'll talk about some of my research on sea urchin embryos funded by the National Institutes of Health. Not because the National Institutes of Health wants to know what keeps sea urchins healthy, but because the National <laughs> Institutes of Health realizes that by studying other organisms we can learn about ourselves and learn about our own health. I am an example of this interrelatedness. So my PhD was uh, culminated with some discoveries. One of, one of my favorites is, uh, and, and one, one of my favorites uh, 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 outcomes from that PhD time was the birth of my first daughter. And uh, Chris, when Christy was born, I was just beginning my postdoc, and I had finished studying um, sm small molecules, motor proteins, proteins that create motion within cells, and I studied them in nerve cells. Proteins that move along the cell skeleton and pull on that skeleton to create cell movement, just the way muscles pull on her skeleton to create her movement. I was curious first about how those motors worked in nerve cells, but then I wanted to study how they worked in, ce in, in cell division. If you want to study a particular question in biology, pick a model, pick an organism that exaggerates it. And in my case, embryos are perfect models for studying cell division because that's what they are doing. They're rapidly dividing. I wanted to study cell division, and I did so in a marine organism. So I wrote this grant. I'm going to read it to you. Actually, no. I'm going to read two sentences. Two sentences, OK? First, and this is my postdoc grant to go start my work at UC Davis. I propose to determine in vivo functions of KRP8595, that's this motor, by applying a range of experimental techniques to interfere with its function in living sea urchin eggs and embryos. Dear NIH, I'm going to work with sea urchins. Understanding how these motor proteins function in normal cellular processes <laughs> such as cell division will help us better understand how these proteins may play a role when those normal cellular processes become abnormal. Thus, pursuing a better understanding of the kinesin-related proteins is highly relevant to questions of cancer. And that NIH grant funded my postdoctoral research. We'll come back to this topic in a moment after we talk a little bit more about how those ideas from basic research can produce products in the marketplace. So there's two things that I'm going to let you know that Bob has let out, left out from this little discussion. The first is all of Bob's friends when we were in grad school all agreed that the best cell division experiment he ever did were his children. <laughs> <laughs> Two great successes. And the best <laughs> traits of those came from his wife Sherry. <laughs> the second thing he left out of this is that when he was writing these grants, dear little Christy, who's now my goddaughter, had not yet arrived. And she had actually not yet arrived really close to when she was going to arrive. Bob was insane when he was writing that grant. He was not sleeping for weeks because he was, A, taking care of his wife, right, and all the things that were going on with the impending first child, and B, he was trying to write these grants. So we were also very convinced that there must have been some big reason why because he may not even remember writing that <laughs> whole work. All right. So 
a key piece for us in this in this is that life science commercialization, right? This idea of applied science, it is a process. And this process, simply put, starts with the recognition of a problem. Right? I got a headache. You need to have a problem to start the process off. No, that's not all. Then, once you know the problem, you've got to have an idea related to that problem, right? Shows a picture here of, of Isaac Newton having, having the apple fall on his head, right? And he gets the idea of gravity. A key piece of this is that good ideas often are serendipitous. And remember when he, Bob talked about Dr. Smoot's idea that you don't really know the random walk? Well, this is an example. It even worked 500 years ago when the apple fell on Sir Isaac Newton's head. From that idea, you move into what we would call bench science. You start doing experiments to see if that idea is going to work. Does it have legs, right? But eventually, to get to the drug, such as Remicade or one of the others, you have to start doing product development. In this particular case, I put a little bottle of EPO up, EPOGEN, which is a pretty large uh, biotech drug. Uh, that is still being sold. This drug actually, um, this drug's total sales since its, its inception about 20 years ago is about 45, million, 45 billion dollars. All right, so problem, idea, some science, and then product development. What's shown up here is a, is a scientific timeline of development. And what we thought we would do is just introduce to you this idea of sort of drug discovery. I'm sure that all of you in the back are unable to see this, and I apologize for that. But superimposed on this process, the, at, the, at the beginning we've got a problem. And right in this box it says disease research. What's the disease? Headache, cancer, HIV, immune suppression. You then have to identify a target. You then have to validate a target. You then need to identify molecules, such as that Remicade molecule or the Imitrade, right? That will manipulate that target and manipulate the disease. You need to optimize those. You need to then test those in animals. You need to run them through in vitro tests. All of that is done before you start putting it into humans. Clinical testing includes what's called phase one and phase 2A, phase 2B, and phase 3. Basically, you first figure out if it's going to hurt people. You then figure out sort of what dose do I need to get the response I want to. And then we're going to test and see if it actually works, phase, phase 3. The reason this is put up is so that we can actually get to this point, which is another sort of take-home point, right? That process is a pretty expensive process. So just finding some molecules that we can submit an IND for that are going to go to see if they can become a drug takes from about two to seven years. The average for this is three to four. The average amount of money it takes to get to that one drug, once you have in your head a disease that you want to target, is 25 to 50 million dollars. The clinical phases take from two to four years, with an average of about two and a half years. However, they're much more expensive. Average clinical study costs about 150 million dollars. So the actual outlay for the drug that has to run this gauntlet, if you will, is approximately $200 million. Now, you may have seen in the news numbers that are much bigger than that. On the right side, if you can't read in the back, it says, if adjusted for failures, the cost per successful drug is now about 2 to $4 billion. And some people actually raise that number up to $11 billion. And that has to do with how they decide what was a failure and when what research they sort of put into that pipeline. So what that means is that the large pharmaceutical companies like Merck or Pfizer, when they look at an opportunity, what do they got in their head? Money. Right? Money. I'm, I'm, money. <laughs> That's the right answer. Money. 
but it is money in a way that are very, it's very, very big money, right? Because they're going, I am funding, at least largely, all of these failures that are out there, so I need drugs that are $4 billion drugs. Otherwise, I'm not able to get over that hurdle. This is an effect, and it might come up in questions later if we could discuss it. This actually has some very um, unfortunate, example, unfortunate results can occur from that. For example, because of that, we may get another fifth or sixth male impotence drug, but we will not get a new class of antibiotics because the former will produce billion dollar returns, the latter will only produce a couple hundred million dollars. Because why? You're curing the people. All right. We said that a, there's a lot of risk in this. This is a picture of what they call the drug discovery pyramid. If you put in 30,000 compounds trying to find the ability to manipulate a receptor or a molecule that's involved in disease X, by the time you get to a product, only one has survived. So you've had to push 30,000 different science experiments, 30,000 different analyses through to get to the one drug. That's why it's so expensive, or at least largely why it's so expensive. Superimposed on this idea of science and what's going on in the tests, and we got to go from here, before we go into humans, we got to have the animal tests, et cetera, et cetera, is sort of the way business people, such as myself, think about this process. Who's funding it? Where's the money coming from? What's the risk? At what point is it appropriate to get involved in this, in this game, if you will? The specifics of this are not that important, right? Because they'll change. Depends on sort of what this slide was taken from actually uh, the federal government's standard uh, standards division, who does a lot of analysis on these sorts of things. But basically, you start on this end with basic research, and the key thing I would like we would like you to take home is that that is largely funded by tax dollars, by grants, the NIH, the NSF, right? By the time you get over to product development you've sort of moved away from angel investors, right? Or, or small groups of, of wealthy individuals who are benefacting, if you will, that technology. And you've moved into institutional venture capital. And actually, by the end, really the people who are driving this are the corporations, the Pfizer's, the Merck's, right? Because they have the ability to pull and carry those $150 million clinical trial expenses. Just quickly, this is to show that that problem, idea, bench science, product development, discussion that we started this off with, superimposes on this very nicely, right? And on this end, you've got basic research, federal funding. And on this end, you've got corporations, large corporations getting involved to, to sort of pull those out. So now we're going to go through a few examples. Imbro. Anybody heard of Imbro? All right. Very successful drug. This is a picture of autoimmune disease, a person who has autoimmune disease. And that person's uh, immune system is attacking them. The idea was they realized that that, that that immune system response was occurring because of a, a, a protein called tumor necrosis factor. Right? and its presence in the body. They got the idea that they could inhibit that immune response, thus alleviating the pain and the symptoms of uh, the autoimmune disease, if they could inhibit that protein. <coughs> so they did a lot of bench science to identify what's called a fusion TNF. That fusion TNF was used to generate, when it gets put in the body, it generates antibodies, because it's got a, a special antibody thing and it attacks the extra TNF. That led to the product that has helped hundreds of thousands of people. And in fact, if you talk to physicians who deal with pediatric immune disorders, they have examples of little children, five and six years old, who literally are in a bed, 
and they can't move to even be rolled, they can't even roll them over to, to wash them because they're in so much pain. And after giving this drug within one week, they're playing in the park with their friends. This came from a, a doctor named Bruce Bettler, uh, excuse me, Bettler. He worked at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, and he started playing around with fusion proteins. The University of, South, the, the University of Texas transferred this to a brand new company called Immunex that was founded by these two gentlemen, Steve Gillis and Christopher Henning. A little company called Amgen up in Seattle bought that product, funded that research, and took it out and is now one of the major corporations that is, that is selling it. Again, university academic started. How many, kids, how many people here had kids receive the HIV virus? HIV vaccine? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> HIV vaccine. Yes, we did too. So this is a picture of a little girl who's got bacterial meningitis that was caused by the HIV, by, by Haemophilus influenza B uh, that had gotten into her system. So they had this idea that they would create a vaccine that would prevent this. The bench science that was needed, we're going to talk a little bit about that more in a minute, but the, the Haemophilus bacteria has got this slimy coat on it. I mean, it is gross. Even biologists don't like dealing with it, right? It's all over, and, they, and no antibodies could get in to get the polysaccharides, to touch the polysaccharides, which is what defines that bug as different from them, right? So it would get in, and it would wreak havoc. The science led, eventually, to companies like Wyeth and Sanofi being able to produce that vaccine. That started when Dr. Porter Anderson and Dr. Smith were at the University of Rochester. They were obsessed with the children that were coming in to their hospital with this disorder, and they became obsessed with trying to find a way to prevent it. They worked for 20 years eventually transferring that technology into a company called Praxis Biologics. And in fact, the first versions of that, the, the first versions of that vaccine, old school, they injected it in themselves. That's how they got to where they were. And eventually Sanofi started selling that virus. The last thing I saw was 700,000 and counting children's lives have been saved by that vaccine. That's a great question. Curing it often is much more difficult than actually preventing us from giving it. Vaccines are actually much less expensive to deliver than cures, even though you are delivering them to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. So it's a great question, but as far as I know, there's no cure that has to be done. Yes. Yeah. In fact, this drug now is, is one of the most exported drugs in the world because all of the third developing world countries now, not drug, vaccine, all of the developing world countries are uh, vaccinating their children with this. Taxol. Uh, and, and, and word from my, immunol uh, my immunologist wife there so, uh, says that uh, antibiotics can treat it. Yeah. Thank you. But you have to get equipment. Thank you. Taxol, anybody heard of it? It is the most successful cancer drug ever produced. What's the problem? Cancer. Melanoma, right? Thank you for sharing that, right? These drugs help in the... Thank you. And my doctor has developed something to help with metastatic melanoma. It's in the life cancer. That's very exciting. Yes, it is. Is he here? In, in, where, is, where does he work? Where is your doctor? Yeah, Janina Farber Cancer Institute. Yes, Great place. Yeah, wonderful. So, so that just a little vignette. The, the, the Dana Farber Cancer Center is one of 20 national cancer centers that are spread out amongst our country, and it is one of the best. So that, that's that's fantastic. Melanoma was one of the cancers that they were trying to find a solution for. So. 
back in the 60s, some, some yahoos were running around and they realized that this bark in the, in the Pacific yew tree might have some cool properties. Literally, that's how it started. They thought, if we run natural products, the things that are in the trees and the different plants and stuff like that, we run those through assays, we might find things that inhibit cancer, that inhibit diabetes, right? That, that, that cure many of our ailments. What they found was, in fact, there was something in the Pacific yew tree that inhibited cancer. This is that molecule. When chemists looked at that molecule, they simultaneously drooled with anticipation and then got ready to commit hairy care. <laughs> because that is about as complicated a molecule as you could imagine synthesizing. It took a team of, of hundreds of people over 20 years to basically work out the synthesis for that molecule, which eventually led to the product Taxol, which as I said is the most successful drug out there, or cancer drug that has ever been produced. Arthur Barclay worked at the USDA, and he was the guy that went around looking for all the different extracts and decided which tree, and he's the first person to pull the bark off the Pacific yew tree in 1962. In the bottom, we've got the team from where? Another academic institution. <laughs> See a theme here? Florida State. Those are sort of the last 10 or 15 graduate students that had worked on this project at Florida State for over 20 years and eventually figured out the initial synthesis. That was moved into a company called Taxilog, which worked through how to get it into formulation because it wasn't even soluble. So they had just figured out they got it, and they weren't even able to get it injected into anybody, right? Because it, as soon as it got in water, it turned like an oil. It would never get to people. Eventually, Bristol Myers Squibb and Wyeth had sold that, sold that drug. So, now. So, so Taxol actually works by inhibiting those little tracks that I was studying for my PhD. Microtubules are the name of that track, and they have to be able to assemble and disassemble in cells for cells to be able to move, for cells to be able to behave. Those, those cytoskeletons, those skeletal proteins are always assembling and disassembling, and Taxol blocks that. It blocks the, the, the disassembly process, and therefore it, it blocks cells from dividing. You have to be dynamic in order to divide, so Taxol is an effective drug. It's also a useful tool for a cell biologist like myself, who used Taxol in my PhD research and then went to my went off to my postdoc lab to continue studying cancer. So I go to UC Davis doing these things on studying cell division and sea urchin embryos on one particular motor protein. So here's the idea. Here's where I'm. I, here's what I have in the back of my mind. Now, keep in mind, uh, there there is nobody that would mistake me for an applied scientist. Here I, I, I am a I'm curious about how motor proteins work in cell division. We had just found one that, uh, a few years earlier. One had been identified in squid axons at a marine lab. The first one was uh, the, the first one that moves along microtubules towards the, the tips of nerves was found in squid axons. We had just identified the second one. It was called kinesin-2. It's very similar to that, one, that first molecule, but no one knew its function. We had really good evidence that it would have be, it, that it would inhibit that it was involved in cancer. Here's that evidence, and I'm sorry it's a dim picture, but all I really want you to see is there's two circles here. This is one sea urchin embryo, and this is another sea urchin embryo. And when you label that those skeletons red, you see these lines, and this is one skeleton where the DNA is lined up, and the cell is just about to divide, and that motor protein, that kinesin two, is on these vesicles, on these little bubbles of membrane, it's just in the right place to walk those membrane bubbles to the new cleavage for it, a new space where that cell, where the membrane is going to have to be added. Here's another cell that's just about to divide in this direction. Bring kinesin 2, bring in those vesicles in. If we stop that protein, we should be able to block cell division. I'm going to be a cancer biologist. I'm a basic scientist looking at how cells divide. But I have in my head this idea. And you all funded him. 
to do this. That's true. That's true. Your tax dollars funded Thank him you. to work on this. Thank you very much. And that, but that relationship between basic research with an idea of the human health implication in the back of my mind is always where I was going. And so, here's the experiment. It takes you six months to learn how to micro-inject sea urchin eggs. And then six months of more experiments to do this experiment. So here's one sea urchin embryo. I've injected it with a molecule that will blo block that motor. Sure enough, here we go. The cell is starting to divide, but that's where it should stop. And sure enough, it does not stop. It doesn't stop at all. Here's my control embryo. It's dividing along just fine. Here's my blocked embryo. It's dividing along just fine, too. That embryo goes in the trash. The experiment didn't work. Something's going wrong. Try it again. Same result. Try it again. Same, 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 same. Six more months to demonstrate to myself, really, I've proven that my motor has nothing to do with, with cell division. But... A big clue comes then in the literature from other basic researchers, and they're studying a similar protein in algae. And they notice that in their algal cell, which has two little, um, two little appendages on it, we call them flagella or cilia, those little appendages don't form if it's missing this protein. What if I just knock out the motor like I think I'm doing and let them live for six more hours. If I had just waited six hours, I would have gotten this dramatic effect. Here's my control injected embryo. It swims right out of the chamber. And here's my kinesin 2 blocked embryo, paralyzed. If I had just waited those extra six hours, this is a normal embryo. This is my kinesin 2 blocked embryo. And no longer am I, and, and, and I'm not a cancer biologist anymore. Here's what I thought. I was going to be doing. The problem was cancer. I would target kinesin 2. Now we have a whole new class of diseases that I that my basic research helped uncover through discoveries in algae, discoveries in sea urchin, then discoveries in mice that, that told us that there's a whole new class of diseases. Well, there's a whole cluster of diseases out there we did not know were related but they are because they work through these little appendages. Those little appendages beat on the surfaces of cells to move fluid, but they also stand straight as antennae, and they work as the ears of cells to talk. They talk during birth, or they talk during development, to put your heart on the left. Without them, you get the 50-50, heart on the left, heart on the right. They, talk, they work in your eyes to help you see. Rod cells work with, our, a rod cell has a cilium that senses light. Hair cells, here with cilia, and no cells smell with cilia. Olfactory defects, hearing defects, retinopathies. Your kidney cells talk to each other with cilia. Without normal cilia, you get polycystic kidney disease, which is the disease I'm studying here. That whole class of diseases is now called ciliopathies. And I don't expect you to read the next slide, but here's the Wikipedia list, part of the Wikipedia list of ciliopathies only discovered starting about 15 years ago that these diseases in cell signaling, in, in kidney function, in birth defects, all related through this organelle called cilia. We will find that because basic researchers have human health in mind and keep talking to each other. So, from those examples and that vignette, we hope we've, we, we hope we've uh, given you a few new ideas. Basic research and applied research are interrelated and interdependent. <laughs> You can accelerate them. Acknowledging this interrelatedness can accelerate discoveries in both of those spheres. And that the business of science depends on that interrelatedness. It is a circular relationship of basic science producing discoveries and ideas, applied science producing incentive and funding for basic research. It is also a, a linear process of, of basic science producing ideas for applied science producing products. Thank you very much for your time, and if you have any questions, we'd love to talk to
letters to the DNA and stick it on a chip, they say they got some rights to that. That just came out a couple days ago. So I'm just wondering, what's the legal angle to all of this? Who's protecting what? And what's the impact of the Supreme Court? Did everybody hear that question? All right. So I'm going to try and re re repeat it, and if I don't get it right, you, you correct me. So a, a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court of the United States just invalidated a patent that was held by Myriad Genetics. That patent had, uh, had claims, which uh, sort of defines what the right is, that gave the rights to Myriad to the genetic information. So a gene isolated having the sequence of a particular gene, which was the BRCA gene. That gene was involved in breast cancer, or has been shown to be involved in breast cancer, became a very popular breast cancer test, and a relatively expensive one. The question was, since the Supreme Court just said you can't patent genes anymore, is, is the way that it got put in the papers, what gives? How can you, how, how do patents fit into exactly. this? Exactly, Bob finds something out about this protein, he tries to get a patent on it so his university could get licensing rights mm -hmm. from a commercial to call it. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court says, that's nature produced that protein, you can't get any rights to it. So, so where's the protection and connection? That's the gist of what I'm asking you. Because your whole thesis is things start in the lab and yep. get commercial. So it, 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 it's good. And people, are, when I say what I'm going to say, the first part, people are going to think that I, I, I put you in the audience to okay. ask this question. <laughs> Who guesses where the research for that started? Academia. It started in academia. The University of Utah Research Foundation had their scientists actually identify the BRCA gene first, and they transferred it to Miriam, right? So the first thing is, it was an example of, of, of science that was funded by federal dollars leading to a product, which is the point we wanted to make, the interrelatedness. As to how does it work with patents, um, very quickly, a patent in this country starts off with constitutional rights, all right? It's our Constitution. The Founding Fathers said, under Article I, Section 8, we will give to promote the sciences a limited monopoly to authors and uh, discoverers for their respective writings and discoveries. Okay, so the right to get a patent starts in the Constitution. Our Congress, right, how our system works is legislatures, the legislature gives the laws that interpret the Constitution. Our patent laws say that you can get a patent on the following things. A composition, a thing, a chemical, two, an article of manufacture, like a watch or you know something like that. Three, a machine, you know, like uh, the, the cotton gin. Four, a process, a method of doing something. Okay, those four things are the only things you can get a patent on. In 1980, there was a very famous case that was styled Charkabarti. And what Charkabarti did, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, is he identified little bacterias. And they had a very special property. Those little bacterias ate oil. That was a useful thing. But they didn't really exist in nature. He had isolated, out of all of the bacteria, the ones that would chew the oil. People said, you cannot patent life. There is no way that we are going to let you own a living thing. Went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, wrong. Anything, this is a quote from the Supreme Court, anything under the sun touched by the hand of man. 
and I apologize for the touched by human. Supreme Court of 1987, man. <laughs> touched by the hand of man can be packed. That's why initially a gene isolated from the cell in a state that it never existed before and could not exist in a way that could be used to benefit man by allowing for tests to determine whether people had cancer, for example, you could get a patent on it. What the Supreme Court said was, it is a natural product. Okay, this is how the Supreme Court today juked and jived, right? The reality is, if the Supreme Court, the Supremes as they're called, by the lawyers, they can do whatever they want to do, right? They sort of will adjust to how they want to interpret the law. They decided that they were going to interpret the, the law as it stands today to say the information is what they were actually claiming. And the information is natural. It's, it's, it, it exists. It wasn't changed. It wasn't touched by man. It doesn't matter that it was a DNA molecule. It doesn't matter that it's a thing in a test tube that's now, right? But they focused on the information. That's how it got invalidated. What it means today is that things like drugs, right, which aren't natural, don't have that, that don't have that problem, patents covering those are perfectly fine. In Bob's work, the kinesin protein, right, that was, uh, that, that, that was doing the motor proteins, if you isolate that protein and you put it in, in a, a test tube, it is questionable today whether that isolated protein would be able to be patented. Although they didn't speak directly on it, my bet is no. All right? However, variants of it, uses of that protein in assays to look for drugs, all patentable. Okay? So while it seems like chick, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, right? The, the little, is it the little red hen or the chicken? Little. Chicken little, thank you. <laughs> it's not really falling. It's going to be okay. Right? In terms of does what make the United States great in terms of sort of drug development and innovation? Is it still mostly there? It is. I don't know if that answered your question in sort of a long-winded way. But. Yeah, that's good. Basically, it's the shareholders in the area. Yeah, the shareholders, they've got other products. And the uses, not all of their claims were invalidated. So it's, very, it's a very narrow thing. Uh, but yeah, they, they were scared. Jay Zhang, their, their lead counsel, is a good friend of mine. And he, uh, he, he's been pretty stressed the last six years. This has been winding through for about six years. Yeah? Um, I was wondering if you could kind of ballpark how many drugs, like what percentage of drugs are developed in academia versus a pharmaceutical company. Yeah, we actually, when we were looking at it, it's, the, it's that point. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was um, the, the, of the $150 billion spent annually on research, about six, uh, uh, 55 million is 55 billion is spent in academic labs, and 60% of that is on uh, is on life sciences. So the majority of the of the of the federally funded research is in is in the health science. Well, it's it's actually no, the majority of that is federally funded, but about 40% of it is philanthropy funded. And uh, and industry funded, all of that academic research. So not all of that is going towards drug development. Some of it's going towards life science, uh, going towards diagnostics development. Some of it's going towards uh, biologic development, medical device development. Uh, so I don't know for drugs the, what the what the breakdown is, but it's still a majority of the majority that's done in in, in academic labs, uh, funded by a combination of, of grant money, federal grant money. And uh, philanthropy and, and industry. So I like I like Bob. Don't know for all drugs, but I believe since maybe 2007 or six, they've looked at some studies of of the drugs that are in the pipeline or that are coming through. And of those drugs, it's about 10 percent. However, and this is one of my favorite statistics. So you you have to understand, I love 
this topic. I am passionate about what we are talking about now. And I love this particular fact. 10% of all drugs come from universities, but over 20% of innovative drugs come from universities. What is an innovative drug? What was that now? 10% of the drugs in the last 10 years come from universities, but over 20% of innovative drugs, drugs that are not a third or fourth in class, not a third Lipitor or a fourth Lipitor, not a third or a fourth impotence drug. They are new drugs for new diseases, one-fifth. That is awesome for, 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 for academic research, and it supports fully this premise that Bob and I love together that in, that basic research and applied science, they have to be and are interrelated. Other questions? Can you comment on nanobots and drugs and drug delivery systems and research about it? There's nanobots everywhere. <laughs> They're getting us now. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, so net, so, uh, so, <coughs> I want to be careful. So right now, I'm off. We're off of what I know a lot about. So take whatever I'm saying with a grain of salt. We are absolutely at a spot where the edges of surgery and and manipulation of our systems will be done not anymore by doctors with surgical tools and those sorts of things. But there will be injections and there will be homing, right, homing and, 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 and small <coughs> machines doing some of that work. I uh, have done a fair amount with Georgia Tech and they're a, they're a hotbed for this. They're, their micro centers and, and their nanotechnology is off the charts. Um, it's not, there's nothing really today that is that we are all being affected by, but there will be, I would say, in 10 to 15 years. So will that be a new drug delivery system then, eventually? Yeah, it depends a little bit on how you define that idea of nanobot, right? right. So, so I usually think of nanobots as things that will build cells, that will deliver cells, that will lay cells down, things that will cut and unclog arteries without having to do angioplasty, right? They're gonna kind of go in and they will bore through uh, in, in, in vivo like that. Um, drug delivery, nano drug delivery, I, I personally see as a whole different. Right, it's, it's a good example area. though of interrelationness between scientists. Because nanobots are a combination of, of, of health science applications of engineering principles and so they, very often, uh, research like that, medical devices and tiny medical devices like nanobots, are happening at institutions where engineers and, 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 uh, and health scientists work very closely together. So it's basic research in micromaterials fueling applied research in nanobots and basic research in disease causes that lead to identifiable problems that can be treated by nanobots. So again, it's an, it's an interrelation between disciplines to create those breakthroughs in that micro machinery. Um, but very much, but uh, quite a bit of it is happening at places like Georgia Tech and MIT, where, um, where you have either institutions that have a strong, that have both fields within their walls or relationships with other institutions that, have, uh, that, that, that can combine those fields. Question? Mine's a business question. Um, when you had your example up on the screen of, this is for the academia discoveries and if it's something innovative or, you know, whatever the discovery is, it then goes to a, it seemed like it moved, it was moved into a smaller company which then was passed on to the pharmaceutical. So the, really aca the, academ the academic research um, is funded by our tax dollars, the government, philanthropy, you know, yes. uh, uh, nonprofit foundations. So when the 
university makes this amazing discovery and it moves on down to the next process, yeah. are they compensated for that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people think they are compensated? Just by a show of hands. Yeah. How many? Did everybody hear the question? Sorry, Bob. How, yeah. So, how, so the question is, how many? Um, when when those basic when those ideas spring from universities um, and then pass on to small companies and then large companies, how many of the universities that originate the ideas benefit financially or mean yeah. from from that original idea? It's so, some small so how many? Show of hands. How many think that money comes back? A little bit. A little bit. Little bit. Okay. It's about a quarter. Thank you for for doing that. The answer is yes, it does. And the way that it happens is that when the university gets a patent and they sort of put their stake around what they, what they own, the drug companies or the people who, the, the entrepreneurs who want, to, who, who want to make a business out of that science, they need to go get a license. They need to go ask for permission. And when they get the permission from the university to utilize that knowledge, they have to pay a fee. For successful drugs, those fees are very large. Uh, Imitrate, which was an Emory compound, uh, invented by two, two, two chemists, Ray Schnauze and Dennis Leota, um, very good, laid back, nice guys. Emory got bought out for their license. Emory's portion of that from Gilead Science Center was $525 million. The um, Imbro has benefited Harvard in the mid hundred million dollars. Northwestern University in Chicago for a number of years had licensing returns in excess of a billion dollars that came into their, their university from the science that was being used to, to turn, that was going to drugs. Have a, a comment to add to that, Jim? Having relates to the work done here at NDIDS. That's why. He's our second show. Yeah. <laughs> can, can, I, can I ask one question first yes, that relates to uh, that, the previous question? Do, how about the professor or the academic? How, does, does that uh, woman or man get a cut, or they continue there with their salary? It, or? it depends on the. It depends on the, the way the university handles the discovery. Uh, there are universities that, that, have, that, that are very adept at moving uh, academic discoveries into, uh, into technologies and, and patenting them before they leave the walls. There are researchers who are well connected with those, we call them technology transfer offices, um, within their own institutions. But there are institutions like my own, Wheaton College, that has no tech transfer office yeah. um, yet. And, but may cooperate with other institutions to form uh, relationships like that, where those ideas can benefit the institution and, in fact, the professor. So it creates a, um, a risk. An academic's most important possession is their integrity. Mm -hmm. And protecting that is central to the career progression of any scientist. So understanding where the science that is potentially profit generating and the science that's that, that, that is not directed that way is important for every scientist to make. And it's important for, for each scientist to be aware of and each institution to be aware of. So how do I protect myself? I'm, I'm at a very small college. Um, part of the way I protect myself from being scooped scientifically is, well, well one way would be to play my cards very close to my chest and not tell people what I'm working on. That's not how scientists do, especially not scientists that, that are grounded in basic science to begin with. They, but we like to tell our stories and get those ideas right out there. And that's actually the way they can protect themselves. Because if others know what you're working on, generally, you keep working on it. And it's very clear when that's happened in the, in the molecular motors field when another researcher takes an idea that was somebody else's and runs with it and publishes it first. That scientist does themselves a great disservice. It may feel like a great rush, but 
that, but scooping somebody that way can be professional, uh, professionally very damaging. So, off, so basic researchers will protect themselves to some degree by telling their story, putting that right out there. But balancing that with which stories do you tell first, which stories do you tell later, which stories do you get to a certain point, maybe to a patentable point before you, uh, you, you tell them fully, is an important uh, balance to strike. It works within, the, it, it helps the scientists to know someone in tech transfer, they can give them advice on that. And so this sphere of scientist, business, lawyer working together can help uh, um, create those, that understanding, create those, those balance points. And that's part of what an, an issue that, that arises at any institution like MDIBL, where there are basic discoveries going on and potentially um, new therapeutics every day. The basic research that happens at MDIBL has human health and environmental health as its focus, as its mission. And that mission is funded by grant dollars traditionally because the government realizes that uh, discoveries in marine models tell us about human, tell us about human biology, tell us, give us clues about human health. Discoveries about our environment help us not just understand how eelgrass lives, but they help us maintain the, fun, the foundation of a food chain that supports an entire industry or in, or in our country. So funding basic research in environmental health and human health um, per, uh, advances the economy in multiple ways. But understanding where, those, where the boundary is between um, what you make public and what you, uh, you, advance, you, you bring to a certain point before you go public is important for every institution to strike. One rule of thumb is a third, a third, a third. A third goes to the inventors. A third goes to the department of the inventors. And a third goes to the university as a whole to let the president do with what he will. So should we get to the... Uh, wait, 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 um, okay. One other, yes, yeah, so I want to come back to, to Jim's point. We have a question here. But I wanted to mention that, that MDIBL is very active in that, in, in that balance more and more every day with the, with the, with the creation of Novo Biosciences um, as a for profit uh, uh, company now. Um, MDIBL is, a, is, is, is front and center on that, on that, uh, on that cutting edge and is, is making those decisions and striking those balances today with uh, advances now in regenerative medicine and advances who knows where uh, because of the discoveries that are coming from that, from, uh, from the, the research there in environmental and human health. Yes, please. An observation, a touch of history. I graduated from medical school in 1955. The NIH, which was invented by the National Institute for Science, has been an absolutely extraordinary event in this country, and it has influenced so many of the things you're talking about. Yes. Now, I've had reason to deal quite a bit in China, and in China, they do not have an NIH. They do not have any analog of the NIH, yeah. and we are attempting at this time in arranging cooperation, and incidentally, cooperating with China is on the boards of where we could be, should be, and will be. Yeah. But uh, they don't have an NIH that will fund their young investigators, and so many of them come and work at MIT and Columbia and all over the place here. Well, and, and a fellow named Koontz, do I have his name right, who's on your faculty at, at, at IBL. Did you hear uh, that? He spoke here uh, a couple of weeks ago. At, at any rate, he, he is a Taiwanese. And uh, they, they have benefited so much from our NIH, and it is an, a huge influence that's in the middle of what you're talking about. You're right. And, and a tiny comment, the NIH does not do things for profit. They do things for a different kind of profit. The pharmaceutical industries are hugely invested in doing things for profit. Right. And, and being right. able to recognize, and, and to, to say thank you, Pfizer, by far the largest of the uh, pharmaceutical industries, for all the good things they've done for my hospital and my career, and I'm at St. Louis Hospital in New York City. But uh, thank you. But nonetheless, this distinction between what the NIH has permitted us in this country to do Thank you, Adolf Hitler, for doing a bunch of things 50 years ago, which made it possible for a hell of a lot of smart scientists to come over here and help us found the <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, that is, that, that is I, I love that point. And, and I don't know how, I can't believe how lucky I'm getting tonight. All these great points that are being made. You could not hit it more on the head. If I could just get one little vignette that supports what you're saying. Our country, via the NIH, spends more on basic research in this context than all of the rest of the world combined. We are literally supporting the innovation for the rest of the world. This gets at things like price control, drug price control, those sorts of issues, right? Without the NIH, none of what we're talking about tonight would happen. That, that's, that, that is the point that we wanted to make. You just made it much better for us. Because without that basic funding, without the ability to ask questions that have a possibility of being related to health science, right, or, or, or human health, but which that random sort of serendipitous walk of, of discovery can take place. All the drugs we talked about today wouldn't have, would have, would have happened. Yes? I'll make one comment. I, I just read the other day that with, given the current state of the federal government, yeah. open, impact on science funding, that within a decade, China will surpass the U.S. in science funding. Uh, in science funding? In science funding, yeah. Basic science wow. funding. <laughs> that was a statistic I read. Uh, within a decade. So, so uh, because of the problems in Washington and the, and, and the inability to peep and pass a budget, um, the, the estimates are now that China will surpass the United States in health science research investment um, within a decade. Uh, now, that is that that creates um, there, there, that means there's 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 two ways to address that. One, those of us that are in that are currently in health science research need to figure out ways to continue that despite the paralysis in Washington. The rest of us need to figure out a way to fix the problems in Washington. Um, because that, uh, that is crippling more than just the NIH, or more than just the NIH. But that, uh, but, but that um, the NIH is where we were talking about today. That solution could do more good than just, uh, just for this. Yes, Jerry, please. Just put a quick plug in that this is a very opportune conversation because Congress is considering the NIH budget as we speak. It will go into committee where they will the House has one number, which is far, far lower, um, and the Senate currently has an, a slight increase for the NIH budget. So now would be the time to contact your um, your members of Congress and encourage them to support NIH funding because it's really, really critical for this kind of activity. Right. Right. Can we? Sh should we? Jerry, did you have something you want to say? No, I just was going to maybe call one last question. We're yes. a little after this. But I wanted to make. Do we want to circle back around and talk a little bit more about maybe? The regenerative motor the, the question about how this is, did Kevin maybe a, a Absolutely, answer? absolutely. Or, or I, so, so the question, I just don't want us to forget, right, that, the, that, that there was a, a question or a comment posed about how this is, is, is happening right here. At least I'm, I'm new to the geography. I think we're on Mount Desert Island. But at least on Mount Desert Island. <laughs> <laughs> at, at the MDIBM, right? And, and I, I just want to say, right, I, I've started having an opportunity to, to, to interact with, with those researchers and with Kevin and, and with Bob. And it, it is an amazing, amazing place because all of the good traits that we were talking about here, that's, he, he, that's there and it's being enhanced by what they're doing and all that I've seen. Secondly, Regenerative medicine is about as hot as it gets right now. So if you want to talk to an investor or, or somebody who's looking for sort of the next thing, right, where they're scouting and what they're doing, places that are, that are at the cutting edge, like MDIBL and in, in, in regenerative medicine are where they're looking. So it, I don't think it'll be long until there'll be a huge successful drug coming out of that, that little island, yeah, not Desert Island. So. Kevin, do you want to say something on that or just talk a little bit more about it? Sure. Um, as I said when I introduced uh, uh, David and Bob, I mean, this is a key focus of the lab. We've really uh, poured an enormous amount of emphasis now, as I say, trying to really address important problems and translate that knowledge where we can. Uh, one of our scientists, are you still here, Butin Yin, just had you just had to leave. He made a discovery last uh, summer of a drug that dramatically speeds up tissue repair. 
uh, and uh, regenerative processes in one of the models he works on. Now, the interesting thing about that drug is it wasn't just something off the shelf. We actually leapfrogged some of the stuff that David was talking about. This drug had already been tested in humans for a completely different application. It didn't do that. It didn't do what they wanted to do so well. So it passed a lot of these toxicity tests. It was found to be very well tolerated in uh, humans. So very quickly, because we would like to advance that drug into much further research, and given the paralysis in Washington, etc., uh, we formed a company. I think in about six uh, six months, Noble Bioscientists to really Noble Bioscientists to take this drug to the next level. And uh, that is, again, because we're small, because we can do things quickly and work very quickly, that's one of the key things of this kind of institution. If I had been at Vanderbilt or Harvard and tried to do that, uh, I probably would have shot myself before I even tried to do that. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. One other, any other questions? This is my favorite part of it. So I know you all are staying. But we, go, we got to get out of here. We and need get to let them get down. I know. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time.